last one, the fourth one, is where a lot of people either neglect or misinterpret. I believe in a church that is apostolic. And from here we have the fourth attribute, the apostolicity of the church. Now, apostle, as you know, comes from the word apostolos, which is the one who is sent. So in, I believe in uh, the Gospel of uh, Luke, Jesus calls his 12 disciples apostles and gives them authority to drive out, cast demons, and he sends them out, right? So there to be an apostle is to be sent out by Jesus. But unfortunately, the Roman Catholic Church over the, over the centuries have misinterpreted this passage to be something of an apostolic succession when we talk about the apostolicity of the church by focusing on the authority that Christ has given to apostles, just focusing on that aspect of authority. And since Peter is the one who succeeded Jesus, well, the apostolic succession means then the authority of Peter is now passed down to the next pope, to next pope, to next pope. So all we think about when we think about the word apostol apostolicity is power, authority the church has and the pope has. But that is so wrong. Why? Because we have to ask this question. In the first place, when Jesus gave 12 disciples authority, Jesus gave them authority so that they will go and fulfill the mission. The mission was to cast out demons and to share the good news with them. And therefore, not to engage in mission but to exercise authority alone would be a heresy. Unfortunately, this fourth attribute of the church, apostolicity, has been grossly mis misinterpreted among the Catholic circles, Roman Catholic circles, and as far as the Protestant circles, it has been grossly overlooked. Overlooked. In what sense? Overlooked in the sense that as John 20, 21 says, as the Father has sent you, sent me, I am now sending you. Here is risen Christ sending the whole church into the world to engage in mission. But what does the church do? The church is content to remain in its own church walls. Now you say, why are we doing that? Why are we not engaged in missions outside church walls? I would say, foremostly, it's because our uh, leaders do not have a strong understanding of what the church is, as the, as the Bible taught us. As aptly summarized in this creed, I believe in one holy, catholic, and apostolic church. And if I believe in it, then I believe that all of us church members have been sent out from Monday to Saturday to wherever God has placed us to be his light and salt. So, that is uh, um, a bit of a uh, theological foundation. Now, I discovered, you know, this, by the way, is, is coming from this missional conversation that, have, that has really swept North America. And uh, if you go to any seminary in North America today, it would be almost impossible uh, not to graduate with MDiv uh, without hearing the word Leslie Newbegin, uh, or some of these people related to missional church conversation. Uh, however, I discovered that long before, long before the missional conversation by the, the ecumenical circles, uh, did you know that in the Lausanne Covenant, as early as 1974, there is a clear, clear expression of the church that is apostolic. Let me show you. By the way, when I was teaching here uh, a course called Biblical Theology of Missions, I taught the Lausanne Covenant, treated almost like the sacred writing, and uh, almost did the line-by-line -line exegesis together. Because, you know, I encourage you to go home and uh, uh, get acquainted with the Lausanne Covenant. It is gem. 
uh, and uh, you would be at uh, uh, extreme disadvantage not knowing what's written there. But let me share with you from uh, um, Luzon Covenant, paragraph number six. Okay, let me read. We affirm that Christ sends his redeemed people into the world as the Father sent him, and that this calls for a similar, deep, and costly penetration of the world. We need to break out of our ecclesiastical ghettos and permeate non-Christian society. In the church's mission of sacrificial service, evangelism is primary. World evangelization requires the whole church to take the whole gospel to the whole world. The church is at the very center of God's cosmic purpose and is his appointed means of spreading the gospel. But a church which preaches the cross must itself be marked by the cross. Now, there are a lot of stuff here, okay? Let me go back and uh, share first here. It says the church needs to penetrate into the world. See, the relationship between church and the world is either one of total separation, right? In other words, we do our own thing inside the church, okay? And whatever you guys do outside the church, in the world, in the pagan world, that's up to you. So here we have, um, in a lot of conservative circles, we have this total isolation between the church and the world. And then in some of those liberal circles, we have a total accommodation. Church is world, and the world is church. There is no separation between the two. There is a complete, almost complete accommodation and assimilation. That also is a problem. So in this first case, where church is totally separated from the world, the gospel becomes irrelevant. In the second part, where church is totally consumed by the world, the gospel becomes powerless. It cannot change the world. So we have a, a choice between you want to be irrelevant or you want to be powerless. And neither serves the purpose of the gospel. And what Luzon Covenant teaches us is that we don't need to resort to either of the two. We have third option, and that is meaningful engagement, costly penetration into the world. That's really echoed in 1 Peter 2.9. We are here to declare the praises of him who has called us out of darkness into his glorious light. We were in darkness before, but he has taken us, pulled us out of darkness, and now our job is to declare his praises by, to people back, in, back to people in darkness. That's coming out of darkness and then going back into darkness with a sense of purpose. And that's what missionary church is. Now, if you look at this expression, the church is at the very center of God's cosmic purpose. Wow. Now, church is not at the center. That's not what it says. The church is at the center of God's cosmic purpose. God's cosmic purpose is the center. And church is there to serve God's cosmic purpose. What is that cosmic, God's cosmic purpose? That is the work, God's work. What God wants to do in this world. And God is using his church to accomplish that. God's cosmic purpose and his appointed means of spreading the gospel. But the problem is this, the church that is preaching the cross, if it refuses to bear the cross or to show the signs of the cross, then there is a problem of authenticity. The gospel we are preaching is not really the gospel. And that is apparently a lot of issues Everywhere we go, really, it's not just pertain to one country. I know, like my my motherland, Korea, right now is just um, the churches are under so much fire because some of the church leaders have been known to be um, really not holding up, holding up the kind of authentic lifestyle that is called upon. So 
If this is God's purpose for the church, now let's see where the churches are today. Dangers of, I don't care whether the church is big or small, all churches are, have to be careful about a lot of dangers that they face. First, if your church members are seeking spiritual comfort and is looking to your church as like a haven, and that's no more than that. Just that's, that's all there is to it. Well, then, you know, that's a, that's a danger sign. Because it's like uh, you're going to have a lot of ingrown church members. Also, if your church members have this consumer mentality, why did you choose our church? Well, because I, I like your church. I, I love uh, a praise. I love the band. Why did you choose our church? I love the Sunday school. It really teaching our kids the word of God. Why did you choose our church? Oh, I love pastor's sermon. Okay. I mean, those are okay. And I'm not saying that they're bad. And please, if you're going to preach, preach well. Please don't put people to sleep. Yeah. You know, there's a saying that, um, uh, there's, a, there's a saying that, uh, preachers and bus drivers have in common. Bus drivers always say, please go to the back. Preachers say, please come to the front. <laughs> Think about that, why? So, but you know, um, if that's the only reason why people choose your church, then they are consumers. They are there to consume religious products that you have created, okay? But we are not interested in having people to be simply consumers, spiritual consumers. We want people, yes, of course, we want them to be fed. No, no question about that. And I'll show you some of the things that I'm doing in, in my church. But that's only half the story. So you feed them, and then what? Can you imagine as you grow older and your metabolism rate goes down every morning, Every lunchtime and every supper time, you get big, big plates of whatever food on the table, right? And you don't exercise at all. What's going to happen to you? I, you know, when I was in my 20s and even 30s, my goal, my, my prayer request was, God, please help me gain weight because I'm so skinny. Like when I went to Amazon, I weighed 120 pounds. And when I came out two, three months later, I weighed 100 pounds. This is a grown-up man, 100 pounds. This is embarrassing. Now, at some point, my biological clock uh, changed or whatever. So now, if I eat specially rice, if I eat two bowls of rice per meal, I can guarantee you within one week, I will gain five pounds. Now, another week, another five pounds like that. What does that mean? That's danger. That's not good. Okay? So just because your church is growing doesn't mean your, your church is going in the right direction. Please, please don't be fooled by that. Consumers. If your church is only attracting consumers, then the moment you are not providing religious goods, they will go to another church. Okay? That's a fact. The problem with churches that have no purpose and no direction is also that there is no accountability. Whether you belong to a small group, whether you come to church on Sunday, whether you're giving your, your offering properly or not, nobody can check on you. That's a problem too. You are creating church members who are very, very unhealthy. Okay? And unhealthy church members will make the church very unhealthy. If your church is growing, there's an illusion that, wow, last year we were 50 people, this year 100, next year 150, the year after 200. There is this illusion of big numbers as though it represents strength. But please, please wake up. Just because you look at some of the best soccer players and do you see anybody who is overweight? 
No. You look at the size of their like, legs, they're like, not that big. Especially, look at those calf muscles. Small, but they're tight. They're made to run really fast. Made to run very quick. Made, made to turn very quick. So, I don't think we should celebrate the fact that our church has grown to be 300 compared to 200 last year. The question is, those 300, are they mobilized for, the, for God's mission? When you call them, can you count on them? That's the question. And of course, the ultimate danger is church members being very selfish. Selfish. So when you need them, they will say, oh, pastor, I cannot come. Why can you not come? No, I just too much work. You cannot rely on them. They're all selfish. Okay. When you, after you preach, they'll shake hands with you and say, Pastor, that was a great sermon. You know, each time I hear that, I would like to challenge them by saying, in what ways is the sermon great to change your life? Please tell me, how, I, how is your life going to be changed? So, um, from now on, I'm going to share with you transitioning into a, from a good church into a missionary church. And uh, it begins with the recovery of the biblical teaching, the apostolicity of the church, uh, this long lost important trait. You know, um, uh, when you read the apostle, when you read the Gospel of John, it is so clear. It's written all over the Gospel of John. God, who is in the business of sending, sending his son. And the son who is in the business of sending his church. It's so clear. God is a missionary God. God is a sending God. So we, this is what we need to recover in our churches. Okay. You know, um, uh, three weeks ago, our church has done something that we're not used to doing. Um, our church has done a lot of um, uh, sending in some ways. We've sent missionaries out, and we've also done a lot of um, uh, uh, church planting amongst non-Koreans in, in Toronto and so on. But we've never done another church planting of a Korean church in Toronto because we've always felt that there are enough Korean churches and we don't really need to plant another church. But in the meantime, the church is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So a couple of pastors came up to me a few months ago and said, Pastor, having served Jesus under you for the last 11 years, we have been inundated with this teaching that our churches need to be missional. So here, here we are. We want to go out and we want to start a missional church where church members are thoroughly trained and then they are sent out to change the world. We want to actually create that church. So would you bless us? What they meant was, would you allow us to take church members with us? So I prayed and discussed with elders and said, okay, let's bless them. So they have eight weeks to choose anybody they want to choose in the church. Four weeks of vision sharing followed by four weeks of prayer. And after eight weeks, now people will sign up. And whoever signs up, you may take them and go and start missional church. Uh, and, then, and then I said, uh, there are four kinds of people that I want you to either go or not go. So these are four areas you should check whether you should go or not. Number one, I want people to go the kind of people the pastor does not want them to go. I want them to go. You know, like when you are a pastor, there are some church members, you, you're so grateful because they're there with you. They're your, your, your hand and your feet. You know, they, they, they care for you. And when, whenever you ask, you ask them to do, they will, they will do those things for you. Well, I said, those people need to go. And number two, 
the people that pastor wants to leave the church, those people please do not go. Because if you go, I may be happy, but you will make them very unhappy. And number three, as you pray, if the Lord makes it very clear that you should go, then you have no choice but to obey. Go. And number four, just because your friends are going, that shouldn't be the reason why you should go. You must not go. So I gave them two sets of why they should go and two sets of why they should not go. Well, after eight weeks of uh, uh, vision sharing and prayer, one by one people were signing up. All together, including children, 120 people signed up to go out. And of that number, there were some families that fell into the first category. Those people, the church, the pastor does not want to go. They ended up going. And I felt like, oh, this is very, very tough to swallow. Since I said it, I cannot take it back. <laughs> but I am so sad, so sorry to see so and so, this deacon and that deacon going. Well, you know, that's what it is. That's what it is. In order to transition into missionary church, there are some things we have to do that we may not like. So, apostolicity, sending people out. Thinking beyond the church, thinking about the kingdom of God. And now, humbly participating in the mission of God. Understanding the gospel to be not just soul saving, but really the holistic, the whole person ministering to the whole person, and the balance between the inward journey and the outward journey. Listening to and obeying the voice of the Holy Spirit. And now how do we encourage individuals to live missional lives and also small groups in the church to engage in missional tasks? And how do we encourage our church members to live missional lives Monday to Saturday? Now these were some of the things we had to had to do. So, what did it take to actually get that done? Well, I'm on a 20-year project. I went to Yongnak at the age of 45, and I'm to, this year I turned 59. And when when it's when when I'm 65, that's when uh, in our church we retire at the age of 65. So I have six more years to go. So I figured the first 10 years is laying the foundation, theoretical and theological foundation, teaching God's people what is a missional church and why a transition is a must, that we cannot afford not to transition into a missional church. That's what I did for the first 10 years, mostly by teaching and preaching and all kinds of, just by repetition, over and over and over again. And my final 10 years is putting all that into praxis to really get it done. And that's what I want to show you. And um, basically, there are three steps. The first step is vision. Vision. In other words, if you are ever interested in helping your church transition into a, from a, what is otherwise a good church into a missional church, then you must be very clear about where you're going. If you're not clear, don't go. Don't go because you may just end up taking the whole congregation to the place where you don't even know where you're going, right? So vision is important. And I say that this vision comes from the scripture. Read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and understand who God is. God who is sending his people into the world today. You see, I don't even care if we don't use the word missional, because missional is a term that was coined about 20, 30 years ago by missiologists in North America, right? Missional, because people wanted to separate the word missional from missionary or mission-minded, because as long as you use the word missionary or mission-minded, you're still describing something of the church that is part, not whole. But when you use the word missional, and now you're describing the whole church. And therefore, mission is not some sort of a departmental activity, but it is the activity of the whole church. And that's why the word missional was, in, was coined. 
But I don't care if you don't, if you don't use the word missional anymore. Because I believe that the word missional is not a fad, as some kind of word that comes and goes. Because the concept is deeply embedded in the scripture. And if it's in the scripture, then people will recover it from time to time, every time the concept is lost, except they will use different words to describe it. Well, this concept was unfortunately lost for a long time. Missional. So it starts with vision, and we get to, we have to, we catch this vision from the scripture. The scripture says what the scripture says about the church, vision, followed by training, and then followed by praxis. We've got to send people out and get the job done. There's no point in talking about it all day long. Right? So it's in clearly in three stages, which is what I like to uh, present. And I, we're going to take a 10-minute break now, okay, and come back. <laughs>